everyone and welcome. My name is Devin Cowens and I'm the events manager at Children and Nature Network. Super excited to be here today with Dr. Kathy Jordan, who's the consulting director of research at Children and Nature Network. She's a principal scientist at the University of Minnesota Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Hi, Kathy. Hello, Devin. It's good to be with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this work as a career? Sure. So I am a pediatric neuropsychologist by training. And when I started my career, I was interested in things like lead poisoning, like how can the environment be bad for kids? And eventually I decided that I wanted to shift gears a little bit. And I thought about my own children's real developmental leaps and bounds whenever they would have you know, wilderness adventure experiences or nature-based learning. And that intrigued me. And I thought, you know, that's something that I could spend the rest of my life looking at. And then I realized that's really just a 180 on what I was looking at before. So how can the environment be good for kids instead of how can the environment be bad for kids? And uh, about 10 or 11 years ago, I had the really good fortune of meeting Sarah Milligan Toffler. And um, I've been with Children in Nature Network ever since. Thank you, Kathy. At Children in Nature Network, we like to say that spending time in nature makes children healthier, happier, smarter, more successful in school, and better stewards of the environment. Can you tell us a little bit about how nature supports children's physical health? So one of the primary ways that nature supports children's physical health is through increasing physical activity. When you increase physical activity, you're you have better physical fitness that supports sort of lifetime weight control and avoids some of the chronic illnesses like cardiorespiratory disease and diabetes and things like that. Um, there's also evidence that uh, early exposure to the outdoors and particularly sunlight um, helps children develop normal vision and avoid nearsightedness or myopia. Um, also that outdoor exposure, sun exposure, within limits is good for maintaining healthy levels of vitamin D, which supports mental health and immune function. And then things like getting your hands dirty, um, you know, uh, playing in the soil, gardening, that sort of thing, exposes uh, the child to microbiota, little organisms that actually support um, our health and particularly our immune function. So those are the main ways that um, physical health is supported by kids playing in nature and learning in nature. And Kathy, what does the research say about nature making kids happier? So there are a range of social emotional benefits from exposure to nature. One of them has to do with the development of emotional regulation, our ability to regulate our um, behavioral and our emotional impulses. Nature also um, increases our self-esteem. You know, when we are um, outdoors and experimenting with what we can and can't do, um, you know, kids learning how to jump between rocks or balance on a log, it really increases our sense of confidence and self-esteem. Other mental health benefits include the improvement of negative emotions, like decreasing depression and decreasing anxiety, and generally increasing positive emotions, like a sense of wellness. A lot of this has to do with stress regulation. You know, nature can really kind of get under our skin and affect our stress physiology and help us better regulate how we cope and respond to stressful situations. And generally, when children are exposed to nature, playing in nature, learning in nature, they're developing a sense of resilience and the ability to, um, you know, just kind of cope better um, under all sorts of different kinds of circumstances. And how does nature aid in making kids smarter, Kathy? So there is some really interesting, relatively new research on this idea of smarter. Um, you know, we used to think about intelligence being something that you're just kind of born with. You know, you're kind of smart or you're not kind of smart, and that's the way it is. Um, but we now know that all sorts of environmental factors can affect intelligence, either helping to improve it or actually affecting it in a negative way. The idea that nature could affect intelligence is actually a relatively new finding. Um, and there is research, not a lot yet, but some research that demonstrates that kids who grow up with more greenery around their home 
have higher IQs in both the verbal sense and the visual motor sense. Um, so that is exciting, relatively new research. Um, there's also research that suggests that um, when kids are exposed to greenery growing up, like, you know, lots of trees in their neighborhood and that sort of thing, it actually changes how their brain develops. There are larger brain volumes in areas of the brain that are important for things like attention and learning and memory. So I like to say nature really does help us build a bit better brain. And what do the findings tell us about children who spend time in nature being more successful in school? Well, nature-based learning is um, a form of learning where kids have exposure to nature, learning outdoors, elements of nature integrated into um, the curriculum. They're really learning in and with and through nature across the curriculum. And when teaching is done in that sort of way, the evidence suggests that there's an increase in academic skills like reading and math, increase in knowledge, things like science knowledge and social studies knowledge, um, greater achievement like higher grades and higher test scores, graduation rates from high school and things like that, um, enhanced learning engagement and just attitude towards school, and also better self-regulation in class. So better able to control yourself, to pay attention and, and learn what you need to learn. What's interesting is like, why does that happen? And we think it's for a couple of different reasons. Um, for one thing, nature itself impacts certain cognitive and emotional functions which support learning. So attention is better, focus is better when kids are learning in nature. There's a attention restoration theory it tells us that there are two systems of attention in the brain, one of them very directed and effortful, uh, like when kids are studying or having to pay attention in class, and the other just really involuntary, effortless, something just grabs your attention just sort of naturally. And the directed attention system can get tired, but then when kids have the ability to have a nature break or when they're learning outdoors, that system that is involuntary just kind of takes over and allows the directed attention system to take a break. And then when it really has to focus again, it can do so with like restored attention. So that's the cognitive effect of being in nature. The emotional effect has to do with stress. Um, nature helps control cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Um, it helps us maintain a healthy um, diurnal rhythm or daily rhythm um, of cortisol. And generally in situational, you know, stressful situations, it helps us, nature helps us regulate our stress response. And when stress is better controlled and attention is, is uh, good, you know, we learn better. So that's the effect of just being in nature, learning in nature. But then nature-based learning also has certain characteristics, pedagogy um, characteristics that are high impact pedagogical practices. So nature-based learning tends to be more inquiry-based, more phenomenon-based, more active, more social, more collaborative. All of those are um, demonstrated in educational research to be very important high impact educational practices, and they are the characteristic practices of nature based learning. How does nature make children better stewards of the environment? So, we used to think that if we just told people, kids, adults, anyone, what is going wrong with the environment, what the problems are, and what they could do about it, they would do it, they would act. But we now know that that's not true. It all starts with an emotional connection to nature that comes from having experiences, preferably as a young child in nature, where the child can develop an emotional connection to nature. That comes from free play in nature. It can also come from having experiences with what we might call a nature mentor, you know, someone, in, an adult in their life who introduces them to their own love of nature and um, allows them um, both the freedom to play in nature, but also sort of transmits their own values 
um, of protecting the natural world and feeling wonder and awe and curiosity about the natural world. So when kids experience that kind of nature engagement, they develop their own emotional connection to nature that opens them up to um, positive environmental attitudes, which opens them up to learning about environmental issues. And then they are in a position to know what's wrong, know what to do and care enough to take action. We often say, or I'll quote actually, um, a couple of important people. One of them is our own Richard Louvre, who in writing Last Child in the Woods, Rich said, if we're going to save environmentalism and the environment, we must also save an endangered indicator species, the child in nature. And then David Attenborough said, no one will protect what they don't care about, and no one will care about what they never have experienced. Kathy, what else should we consider in the research findings? Well, with all research, there is a, I guess, a developmental trajectory. Um, research becomes more sophisticated over time, and we begin to answer questions or ask at least the questions about things like not just if something works, but how it works, why it works. When does it work? For whom does it work? Under what situations does it work? And the kids and nature research is more and more at that level of sophistication. And so we're learning some interesting things about um, how children's age might affect things like their connectedness to nature. Um, connectedness to nature takes a little bit of a dip in adolescence, um, but then it comes back typically um, in young adulthood. Um, we're learning that boys and girls respond differently um, to nature. They sort of need different things um, in nature. They have different levels of connectedness to nature um, in different stages of their lives. Um, we are also learning that um, economic advantage and disadvantage is a really important thing to be looking for in or paying attention to in the research literature. It's called the equigenic effect. And this is the idea that children from more disadvantaged backgrounds actually benefit more from being surrounded by greenery, from participating in nature play and nature programming and nature-based learning compared to their more advantaged peers. So the reason it's called equigenic is because it essentially helps equalize between advantaged and uh, more disadvantaged children. So children who are experiencing opportunity gaps and resulting health disparities and educational disparities can actually begin to narrow those gaps because they are sort of more responsive to nature-based interventions than their more advantaged peers. And I'm particularly excited about that finding. Um, and I think we need to, to pay a lot more attention to not just controlling for socioeconomic status, but actually examining the effect of socioeconomic status on the relationship between nature and children's outcomes. And I think that will tell us a lot about how we can target different kinds of um, nature-based interventions for the kids who need it most. And those children are likely from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly those who have less, ac less access to uh, nature-based programming and nature in their environments. This is so wonderful. And I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you, Kathy. Can you tell me what you're most excited about in this growing field? So you said the word growing, and that's something that I'm very excited about. You know, when Rich Louvre wrote um, the first edition of Last Child in the Woods, I think he says he based that on about maybe 50 or so articles in the scientific research. That's all he could find. And we've now summarized in the research library over 1400 articles, and that's nowhere near all of them. We, that it's coming so fast and furious now that we can't even keep up. Um, so that excites me, scares me a little bit, but excites me too. Um, so this has really become, I guess, kind of mainstream. Lots of different disciplines um, and sectors of society are interested in this. Researchers are approaching this from all sorts of different angles. 
one of those angles is a more neuroscience and neurodevelopmental look at this. Um, and that excites me as a neuropsychologist, but I, it also excites me because this is the kind of research that we get into when we're really at the stage of research maturity, where we're looking at mechanisms. Why is this happening? What's happening in the brain, you know, that um, could be an explanation for why nature is impacting kids in certain ways. And, you know, when we get findings like from imaging MRIs that, that show that the brain is literally different on nature, that excites me. And I think um, that is just a whole area that um, is, is going to, you know, burden, burgeon, I think. And then the other thing that really excites me is the potential for nature to, um, because of that equigenic effect, the potential of nature to really address some of the you know, major societal issues that have to do with disparities um, and opportunity gaps. And, you know, it's a relatively inexpensive uh, intervention. It has um, benefits in all sorts of different realms of kids' lives. And if it can also help close some gaps that end up, you know, essentially um, causing disparities, health and educational and other sorts of social uh, disparities um, between kids with advantage and kids with economic disadvantage. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and we all should be paying attention um, across all sorts of different sectors, education, health, mental health, how we design cities, um, you know, what we offer, you know, part, where, where and how we offer parks, you know, in cities and things like that. So I'm really excited about this idea of social justice and nature and how equitable access to nature can uh, really improve all kids' lives, but in particular, improve the lives of kids who um, are you know, at risk for poor developmental outcomes because of their economic backgrounds and their lack of access to nature. So thank you so much, Devin. It's been great talking with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. And thanks to all of you for watching this presentation. You can learn more about the benefits of nature on our website, childreninnature.org. You can also access our free online research library and our resource hub. We invite you to become a member of the Children in Nature Network. You can also stay on top of the latest news and research by subscribing to Finding Nature News and our Research Digest. Thanks so much.